Um, I'm going to request uh, Nitin Desaiji to make his comments and reflections. Um, Nitin Desaiji, Chairperson of uh, Institute of Economic Growth, and for many years and decades uh, uh, involved in global development. Thank you very much. Uh, let me say it's a pleasure for me to be here where uh, it's about uh, the occasion which is also celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Sussex Institute of Development Studies. Fifty years ago I was, at, I was teaching in an English university and ideas were set up. And those were, those were harsh days. It was the days when the development uh, it was really much more central to the agenda. We had a Labour government there. Barbara Castle was in the, uh, in the, in the, the development ministry. And the I remember the days, excitement. The good old days. Hmm? Good old days. Yes, I remember the excitement which was generated when the institute was set up. I wasn't teaching that. I was uh, more involved in the more rarefied areas of economics, like uh, you know, optimum growth, etc. etc. I would leave that to one side. Uh, but it's a pleasure for me to be here, and also because of during my tenure in the UN, I was quite involved in placing some of these things on the global agenda, particularly at the time that we did the. World Social Summit in 1995. Mm -hmm. Do look at it. That is the summit which actually pays serious attention to the multidimensional nature of poverty. That poverty is not just how, what you measure in terms of consumption distribution or even income distribution. It includes marginalization from politics, it includes alienation, it includes discrimination in society, and that all of these things have to be brought together to understand what uh, uh, is poverty. And, and you know, in many ways, uh, it is very. When you talk, when you talk to poor uh, the people, you also understand the uh, the, the <coughs> complexity. I think uh, it was a, a person I remember who did a survey in Rajasthan of poor people, and he asked them what was, what did they want, what what was their priority. I'm not sure who this was. I, my memory is failing a little. So let's. I think it was probably our chambers who uh, did this very informal survey. And he asked them, and he thought he would come up with the usual things, you know, jobs, water, this, that. So the thing which came out on top in the priorities was self-respect. And I think we need to keep that in mind, that in the final analysis, we are talking about these things, because in the end, if you are, you want to live in a world where every person feels a sense of their self-worth, then this is an important dimension of self-worth. So I just thought I'd leave it at that. Uh, Rajesh has asked me to focus more attention on, if you like, policy implications and so on. Incidentally, I'm, we're very happy, incidentally, that IDS is now not just an institute of studies for of developing countries, but embedding its work in a much broader context of uh, uh, how all this fits in into a global economy. But to isolate a set of countries called developing and uh, do research on that is not some is not adequate in uh, uh, to the today's work. Uh, in fact, it's increasingly inadequate to look at the developed world in isolation. And what happens and the prospects that you face in Europe or the United States are not independent of what's going to happen in the uh, rest of the world. I also want to say a word or two on why this sudden interest in inequality. Uh, I think part of it is, of course, the numbers, but it's not as if the numbers are dramatically worse than they were 10 or 20 years ago. I think the reason is the fear that it's going to get worse. That is what is driving the thing. It's the fear that it is going to get worse because of what is happening in the uh, way in which, uh, for instance, income is being shifted from productive processes to financial processes. You must have seen studies of how the proportion of income accruing to financial services has, uh, has shot up. It's very interesting in the graph that you show. The two things start coming together. The, uh, the, the increase in the, uh, in the wealth of the richest 62 and the decline in the wealth of the top 50 percent actually is after 2009. Till then, it's sort of in parallel. If you go back to that graph, it's more or less in parallel. And then it starts squeezing. So that's one thing. The other thing is what you referred to, which is the uh, prospects of 3D printing, robotics, automation, etc., on uh, employment. And already the returns to intellectual property are so much greater than the return to labor as such 
it, a simple thing like an iPhone or an iPad. 70% um, incidentally, Apple does not manufacture anything. It does not have a single manufacturing facility. Its income accrues entirely from its design, its intellectual property, its marketing, its financing. 70% of what you and I pay for the iPad goes to those engineers, designers, marketing men, financiers. And only 30% goes to the people who actually put this thing together in Taiwan, China, Malaysia, uh, or, or, or wherever. And that's happening, what would go away naturally. To part of this is this uh, fear that this whole process of uh, this huge growing divide between the returns to intellectual property and the returns to, uh, let us say, labor, or even other forms of property, like owning land or something, is becoming wider and wider and wider. And that probably is one reason why it does. But then you're fighting off this broad. We work up show on the numbers. Uh, there will have more to say. I must incidentally, there are some numbers now which actually talk of income inequality in India as distinct from consumption inequality. And the numbers which came out in the uh, Indian Human Development Survey yes. show a, level, a GDP coefficient which is more or less comparable to Brazil. You're looking at, it also shows a deterioration. Huh? 56%. Yeah, it's actually slightly higher than Brazil, if I remember right. Yeah. Marginally higher than, less, than yes, Brazil. Also. Five, they are 0.54, we are 0.56. Marginally higher than Brazil, and it's gone, gone up. Am I right? Yeah. It's gone up well, certainly since 1990. Across the last two surveys, yes. Yeah, no? and it has, it has gone up. But I'm sure Jayati will have much more to see on this than I will. So let me focus on the policy. And I really wanted to hand what I want to see on policy or something that. Uh, uh, Dr. Javanta said, and I'll pick on three areas. One, policy as you conventionally understand it, what you call uh, no. the second, the collective action dimension. Third, addressing embedded uh, inequalities. First on the policies that I would say have need to be looked at. I want to focus on four areas. One is the fiscal system. One of the things that has happened is the loss of progressive, progressivity in our fiscal system. Uh, the, you, it's partly started with the you know, uh, simplification, which was probably desirable, the simplification which was done in 96 by Chidambara in the 10, 20, 30 uh, uh, tax system. But if you see it since then, the adjustment of the exemption limits and the limits at which the maximum applies have gone up much faster than inflation. So that over, these, over this period of roughly 20 years, what you've seen is that in real terms, the, uh, the point at which the income tax kicks in and the point at which the maximum kicks in has actually gone up. In that sense, progressivity <coughs> is less. There are other dimensions of progressivity. One which I always complain about is the Chidambaran's removal of dividends from personal taxation by saying on the argument that it is being taxed at the company level. So why, how can I tax it twice? The problem there is that Mr. Ambani, who gets several thousand crores in dividend income, pays the same proportion of his dividend income as tax as me as a pensioner does. So that's clearly a loss of progressivity. Uh, there are other dimensions also, for instance, inheritance tax. India is one of the very few capitalist countries in the world which does not have an inheritance tax. There are one or two others. I think Australia doesn't have one. But there are one or two others, but there are very few. Almost every country, including the United States, has a strong inheritance tax system. We do not. I remember once when I was called to a, uh, the usual pre-budget meeting by Chilambram, and I just happened to mention, along with Prabhupada Pratapano also, we mentioned, I just happened to mention uh, the possibility you know, that we don't have it. I just said we don't have an inheritance tax. I don't say, I didn't say that to do it. <coughs> the next day, the newspaper report, uh, the inheritance tax was promoted by Nitin Desai, who was chief economic advisor under the socialist Madhu Dandwari. <laughs> so that's more or less the attitude now. But it is, I, I have sensed over the past few years, it's gradually getting some respectability and traction. But this is, these, are, these are some of the areas we need to address. A tax system which is, uh, does not, progressivity is not eroded. I said, I'm all for simplification, but you should not have raised the uh, levels of the exemptions so fast that you basically uh, 
uh, made uh, in real terms, you uh, there was a loss of progressivity or what or dividend tax. Something is being has been done now. Uh, the inheritance tax, I think, is frankly overdue uh, in, in this country. There is no logical, sensible, practical, economic reason for not having it. But let's see whether we will ever uh, get it. The second area of policy that I would like to focus attention on, and I'm going to leave much more of this to Gautam to talk about, is the fact that about 85% of our labor force is in the informal sector. The labor reform we need is not what the press is writing about. You really don't have a huge problem of, uh, in the so-called organized sector. Who says that you can't downsize? Go and have a look at the record of Tata Steel or ACC. Uh, and how many, uh, what has been the reduction in employment in these, did, were they ever stopped? Every day you see reports in the press about Flipkart or Snapdeal laying off X thousand people, but they were stopped. Where is the evidence that uh, the labor law is stopping people from uh, downsizing? But the fact is the 85, the real labor reform we need is for the 85 percent who are outside this system, who have no form of uh, employment protection, social protection, or any such thing. They are the people, that's the labor reform we actually need in, the, in this country. The contract labor and the 85 percent who are uh, outside. The third area where we have made it, where it has been a real disaster is the fact that almost all of the developments in education and health over the past couple of decades have almost all been concentrated on the services which are going to be provided to people at the top end of the income bracket. Super speciality, health clinics, etc., etc., etc. Uh, not in the services which need to be provided to the mass of the population. Uh, why is it that tuberculosis today is no different, the treatment of tuberculosis today in India is no better than it was 20, 30, 40 years ago, even though we are a much richer uh, country? Uh, the same thing can be said perhaps of education. And how, what, what can one do about it? Take education. Let's focus on public, the public system of education. We have embedded, this is basically operated at the state level, we, uh, and we have embedded it in the system of patronage politics. The <coughs> schools are run by a minister sitting in the state capital, and ha most of the time his only interest is in transfers, postings, and promotions, uh, sometimes for uh, political reasons, sometimes for more pecuniary reasons, and it's ridiculous that the school system should be run in a state the size of Lupi by uh, one man sitting in, in, in Lucknow. We have to take, the most important reform we need is to take the power of running the school system away from the state governments and embed it in the local authorities, local bodies, etc. Uh, without that, I don't think we're going to get any quality improvement because today, the, what, to get quality improvement, I need schools which the principal can control. Our principals are powerless in public schools. Absolutely no power, because the, school, uh, the teachers are not beholden to them for their jobs, either for getting the jobs or staying in their jobs. They've got their jobs for political patronage. They often don't even turn up to uh, teach. And uh, the only way to do that is to empower the principals, empower the parents at the local level. Without that, you're not going to get quality improvements, however much money uh, you throw at this. I think similar solutions are required at the health uh, system end also. But I'm going to leave both those things to people of our better informed than I am, which is Dr. Men, like he was sitting, uh, sitting there. That's what, so, these are some of the areas of policy, the tax reform side, the labor reform side, and labor reform not in the sense in which people are talking about in the press, with the labor <coughs> that I'm using the term, but 85% who are entirely outside the official uh, formal employment uh, structure and the uh, system on the education side so that we pay far more attention to the mass, the education that is available to the mass of the people and the healthcare. On the collective action, uh, to me the key area of collective action, if we want social democracy in this country, has to be the labor movement. Uh, it's the fragmentation of the labor movement, the fragmentation of trade union activity, the, 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 the Politicize the, the linkages of proletarian union activity with political uh, you know, uh, compulsions. Uh, I think these are some of the things which need to be addressed. 
And once again, I will happily leave this to Gautam to tackle uh, rather than having to do so uh, myself. My final thought in the, uh, before I end is on the most difficult area, which is addressing embedded inequalities. Let me just say this, that we have a particular problem in India. And the particular problem we have in India is that we live in a country where the dominant religion actually tells us that we are not born equal. <laughs> it's the only country in the world that actually tells us we're not born equal. We are born with a debit balance or a credit balance. And you can do something about it, but you are born with a debit or credit balance. And that deeply embedded tolerance of inequality, because it is presumed to be God given, uh, a product of your karma, is going to be a very difficult thing to tackle. But it is happening. It is happening, and to me, the most hopeful sign that I've seen in the past couple of years in India is the, is the growing uh, evidence of Dalit uh, consciousness. In my state, Gujarat, where it was very rare, very unusual, the very fact that so many of these Dalit groups are coming together uh, in a cohesive way is to me one of the most hopeful signs uh, over the past couple of years that, yes, this is happening. That, uh, it is, that there is a certain amount of uh, uh, collective action of that sort which will truly address the inequalities of uh, caste and gender which are sort of deeply rooted in our social psyche, in our society. So these are some of the thoughts that I have as a reflection. I hope I have not uh, sort of been too, meandered too much, but I uh, hope that uh, this will provoke the panelists who follow to say more than I have done. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. May I request uh, Professor Jayati Ghosh to make her reflection. Uh, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thanks very, very much, Rajesh. You know, Dr. Desai has already said so many things that uh, I was going to say, so it makes my task much, much easier. I want to just actually begin with a plug for this report. I contributed one of the tiny uh, pieces in there. But I have had the occasion now since yesterday to actually look at it, and I'm really, really impressed by it. I think it is one of the most comprehensive in terms of its coverage, uh, both in terms of the approaches and as well as the geographical coverage of the authorship, which is both rare and very welcome. So, you know, thank you for producing this. And I also agree very strongly with the conclusions that John already identified. I think they have very strong resonance in India. Uh, I, Dr. Uh, Desai already mentioned uh, many of these issues, but very, very briefly, if I could say how I think it has the strong resonance in India. First, because inequality in India is much more than we think, or much more than is generally presented in terms of the Gini coefficients, where if you saw the, the chart, we're somewhere in the middle of the sort of global averages, and we keep congratulating ourselves that oh, we're so much better than China and so on. Uh, we measure consumption inequality, as was already mentioned, rather than income inequality, which of course understates the uh, inequality. We also typically do not count the tails of the distribution, so we don't measure the homeless and we don't measure Mr. Ambani either. So uh, there's a significant exclusion even in terms of consumption. But uh, where we have tried to do, where the recent data has tried to do the uh, income inequality, we find Gini coefficients that are significantly high. Uh, he mentioned that you know, 0.56 is what the uh, Human Development Survey found, so it's slightly higher than Brazil, which is seen as a very high inequality country. Village surveys that have tried to estimate incomes in particular villages have found Gini coefficients of 0.6 or more. But more importantly, if you look at the top decile to bottom decile, even in consumption terms, we get really high inequality by global standards. Or if you look even at the Palma ratio, the 10% to the bottom 40%, even in consumption terms, we get really high. The Deutsche Bank estimates of wealth are uh, obscene in the Indian case, and that's obvious to all of us, right? We, we know that we have all these top 10 billionaire members and stuff like that, so that's not perhaps surprising, but it is not enough recognized, certainly, in the public policy domain. Second thing is, as was already mentioned, I think, by everyone here, that, you know, we have one of the most complex systems of hierarchy, discrimination, and exclusion anywhere in the world. And it's a millennial old kind of system. Uh, caste is not just Hindu, it's civilizational. It covers Sikhs, Christians, Muslims, everybody in India, in, in, in South Asia, actually, and in many areas of South Asian settlement. 
uh, it's an extraordinary uh, elastic kind of institution that permeates not just, as, as Dr. Desai mentioned, the mindset, you know, the, the tolerance of inequality, which is such a marked feature of our society, but it also permeates economic relations in a way that I think we have not adequately recognized. We tend to think of all of these things, and particularly caste, gender, and ethnicity, as um, things in which you know people are acted upon because of that, and so they are affected. And so you know the economic growth is unequally distributed because you're at the bottom of the pile for whatever reason, and so on. But you know this intersecting, multi-dimensional kind of nature of inequality, we we may have missed it as social scientists for many decades, but the markets didn't. Okay, capital accumulation in India has been heavily dependent on these social inequalities. In other words, I would argue that really our whole you know, growth process that we're so proud of the last 20 years, which have seen India emerge, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, have been heavily dependent on these inequalities. And but in three particular ways, they have allowed for segmented labor markets, whereby you can actually have castes confined to particular difficult, dangerous, and dirty occupations, which are also extremely low paid. Uh, you can have the uh, huge reliance of both the formal and the recognized informal economy on the unpaid and underpaid labor of women. And you can have the systematic uh, exploitation of natural resources in areas that are populated by tribes with very little political voice. So uh, just briefly to mention each of these, what that amounts to is a massive subsidy to the growth system and to the formal economy in a, in a huge way. Uh, Dr. Desai mentioned about how 85% you know, of workers are in the informal sector, but 96% of workers are informal. Even in the formal sector, there are mostly informal workers. Let me remind you what the definition of formal is in India. We have a very generous definition of formal. <laughs> to be a formal worker, all you will, Gautam knows much more about this, but all you need is either a written contract or paid leave, or any kind of social protection. Just one of these, not all three. Any one of these, you're a formal worker. 4% of our workforce makes it, okay? So we have a very large informal sector with, to which we have not even added the huge unpaid sector, which is, by the way, extremely significant. Um, so it is certainly the case that caste divisions allow for labor market segmentation. But gender distinctions have been particularly significant in the last decade. We are probably the only country in the world that has been growing for 7 or 8% per annum in GDP and witnessed a decline in female workforce participation from already low rates, from 35% on average to 24% on average. Okay, historically unprecedented anywhere in the world. I have not seen any other example. That is if you look at recognized work. If you count unpaid work, that's NSS codes 92, 93, which is to say entire range of social reproduction plus all of the provisioning for the household, collecting wood, collecting fuel, collecting uh, water, uh, kitchen gardening, poultry farming, etc., 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 you find that in fact 86% of women are working. A little different from 24, right? This is actually the unpaid subsidy to the recognized formal and recognized informal economic activity, which has been huge in our economy. Uh, ethnicity, I mentioned, uh, the fact that so much of the expansion of the 2000s was really based on different kinds of natural resource, okay? Rivers, water, mineral resources, forests, spectrum, you name it, you know, it was extracted. Uh, that this was disproportionately based on excessive exploitation and displacement of communities traditionally without voice, particularly the scheduled tribes, is something that reflects this. So essentially, accumulation relied on inequality. And the limits to that, whether they were legal limits, the courts intervening in particular cases, or social limits, when there was resistance from local communities, or other limits, those limits, when they emerged, that became known as the era of scams. In fact, the scams had all happened earlier, but that wasn't called the era of scams. And that became seen as the period when reforms are in paralysis and all that kind of thing. In other words, the, um, the inevitable limits to that extremely inequality-based pattern of accumulation, I believe, are what then led to the period of stagnation, which incidentally still continues. 
Now, obviously then to break this, it's more complex than breaking inequality in some other place where, it's, where the growth process is not so critically dependent on this inequality. So of course we need absolutely many of the policies mentioned in the report and that what, what Dr. Desai already mentioned, I think absolutely right on, on the fiscal progressivity, on dealing with informal workers and on social spending, universal provision of good quality of services that meet basic needs, asset redistribution, uh, control over natural resources, all of these are mentioned in the report. But I think all of these require fundamentally a change in the growth strategy. In other words, we can't do this as long as you know, you're know you doing, if you like, a certain set of macroeconomic policies, trade and industrial strategies, accumulation strategies, and then you're doing stuff on the side to kind of counteract the effects as a response. So I would argue that we need actually a fundamental rethinking if we're really going to do something about it. And I think the report is actually quite good in bringing this out. If we're going to be able to achieve universal good health coverage, for example, if we're actually going to be able to give decent work, good quality employment, we have to shift towards the economic orientation of both policy and processes has to shift towards wage and employment-led growth, which necessarily means more public investment, public expenditure, finance through taxation, as Dr. Desai mentioned, realistic financial inclusion, not some fancy, you know, uh, publicity conscious jandhan thing, but genuine financial inclusion that frees ordinary people from the clutches of local money lenders, significantly enhance social spending. Uh, you know, Dr. Desai is right that money is not enough. You need reforms. And I, I completely agree with you. For example, schooling has to be given to local management and teachers, for example, have to be hired to schools and all of that. I completely agree with that. But money is necessary. And let's face it, we underfund. I mean, it's true that well, the little we fund is not well spent, but oh my God, do we underfund. We are underfunding to that, and we also know that quality is heavily dependent on that. Uh, in the Knowledge Commission, we did a study. The average uh, expenditure in 2008 on children in government schools at that time was 380 rupees per year. The average spending on a child in a central school was 6,480 uh, rupees per year. Not surprising that the central schools are seen as the best part of the public education system. The average spending on children in private schools, the kind that the middle class goes to, was 12,000 per year. Now, you know, with 380 rupees, there's not that much you can do. And if a lot of it is going to salaries, and then you're not exercising the managerial kinds of, you know, you're not doing the right kinds of administration and management, then obviously you're not going to get adequate results. Essentially, I, I think this report is actually great because it gives many different ideas of things that have worked in different parts of the world. It actually is, it doesn't just analyze, which often leaves us in a safe state of depression. It actually gives us hope. And so for that reason in particular, I'm really happy. Uh, and I want to thank both of you for actually putting this together. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, well, thank, thank, you. You. thank you, Rajesh. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, between Joyti and Mr. Desai, they in short, I have nothing left to say. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you have three push. That, 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 that would be a nice change. That would be a nice change. Let me say, I'm, I'm truly honored uh, to be here, and thank you especially for that, for Rajesh, for inviting me. Uh, Professor Gaventa began his work in India in the early 1980s, and most of all around the Bhopal gas tragedy, working with comrades in the organization I come from. I was only in high school at the time, but it's an honor to, to be here to launch of this report. I also want to join Joyti in making a plug for this report. I have, I must say, I only saw it at lunchtime, uh, but I haven't seen something as comprehensive on inequality in one place. Uh, and I would strongly urge everyone to read it. I'm certainly going to ask uh, colleagues in my organization and friends to, 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 to be reading it. It is a very, very powerful document on inequality. Uh, you know, that we live in a um, difficult world, is, there's no doubt. But it also struck me as I look at the report that we, and on today of all days, we also live in a very weird world. Here is a major report on inequality sponsored by the UNESCO, which actually carries in its preface uh, a quote from not just Rousseau, but from Karl Marx too. 
Last night, one of the candidates for the United States presidency, on the other hand, called on the white working class that sees itself alienated because of this, the very inequality that we're talking about, and he called upon them very eloquently in his closing speech last night to lock out the Latinas who are taking away their jobs. So that's why I'm saying we live in a weird world. The UN system actually can put its name to, to a report like this while um, you know, there's something happening. And that's, in a sense, when we talk about what's been said already about social discrimination, you know, at the nub of it, this is the outcome. This is, this is actually the outcome of inequality, and this is the challenge, as uh, John said at the start, whether it's Brexit or, or, or um, uh, Donald Trump, or um, Narendra Modi after a fashion, uh, or the BJP, or the far right in India. Uh, I mean, what's not dealt with in length in this report uh, which, as has been rightly said, has been dealt by economists in dealing with inequality and economic inequality, is the relationship between productivity and wages uh, over the last three and a half decades, both in this country and across the world, that productivity has risen at a pace fast, uh, much faster than wages. Uh, that obviously has a very clear, clear outcome in terms of profit and wage distribution, and therefore, therefore an inequality. But I'd like to flag really our uh, two or three issues that affect uh, working people and therefore society in, to paraphrase the report, in everyday life. Productivity is not just an abstraction that manifests itself in everyday life. One, I mean, one very clear outcome of the scale of productivity increase that has happened is we perhaps have no estimate some of us can see it visually, those of us who work in the trade union can see it visually when we hear stories from the shop floor, but we actually have no estimate as to how much work intensity has increased over the last three or four decades. So it's not just a problem of unemployment, I'm uh, sorry, of, 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 of wages, it's not just a problem of unemployment, but the very people who are at work are working in conditions that are more and more extreme, more and more difficult, more and more demanding, uh, if, if I can, if I can, if I can quote, and I'm not defending this colleague, at a workshop we did on work intensity, uh, a, a, a worker on a truck assembly line, at the end of the day, at the end of two days of disagreeing with us completely, said, "Oh, well, now I understand that that's why I get drunk and go home and beat up my wife." And he actually said it, and he said it with tears in his eyes. It went, but it took him two days of hammering, or three days, if I recall, at a, at a, at a workshop in Chennai. Um, very, very good union hand. But, but this is, uh, you know, uh, this not just affects what you do at home. If you move away from regular work to, to, to irregular forms of employment, then you're dealing with a lot more uncertainty. So to come back to, you know, to bring this back in policy terms, I mean, we've not really thought about a policy framework that deals with work, work, work intensity. We didn't think about that in the 20th century. We spent the 20th century thinking about full employment. That's, I certainly think, something that needs to be looked at as to what is what its economic and social impact is. Um, uh, there's, you know, a second, and I think work intensity relates to that. I mean, we typically treat the question of technological change exclusively as labor displacing. It is indeed labor displacing, but as we know, structurally in the last couple of centuries, it actually ended up hard for us to believe in the trade union, but as we're coming to terms with it, it actually world over created more jobs basically because it, 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 it resulted in economic advance. But we are, we are told today, and your report confirms that at the cusp of a technological advance, that's going to create a very large number, very large numbers of unemployed. It's also a technological advance that's going to contribute, and we don't have a measure of what it's going to contribute, is to a process of descaling. So, so I think these are, these are in a sense, I think sort of new forms, we're going to see new forms of, um, you know, influencing inequality, uh, both economic and social. Uh, you know, I think wage inequality is very well understood, but, 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 but inequality is influenced well beyond wages. And I think it would be reasonably correct to say that long-term employment at lower wages is better better than 
irregular wage contracts with even significantly higher wages. And I think that would come through if we look at responses to health needs, to, 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 to welfare needs. Uh, so, so when we talk about you know, policy instruments, I think the key policy instrument that we need to go back to is looking at, is looking at employment contracts, is looking at lifetime employment contracts. Uh, without that, I mean, you can, you can break this down into part-time work, uh, 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 partial work in a week, all of which actually contributes to various kinds of uncertainty. The fact is every part-timer is more easily replaceable. Yeah. <coughs> Regular work also comes very critically with one, with one thing that I would flag, and that's time off for being ill. That's, that's, that's sick leave. Uh, while those without wage contracts have the one thing they most certainly don't have is sick leave. And that really pushes people, uh, you know, working people off the edge. And that sort of you know affects anyone who doesn't have a, a you know who doesn't have a wage contract. Social security, universal access to health, actually come the next step. But if you don't even get time off, if you're pushing yourself when you're sick, and you're working in a very intense situation, in a, in, a, in a very high pressure physical work, then I think that's 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 a second issue. Um, I think third. What's there in the report, and I'd certainly, certainly critique, it's been very much part of policy formulation over the last 20, 20 or 30, two or three decades, is the whole reference of alternatives as microfinance and self-employment. Microfinance and self-employment, for those who are at the margin, you know, I always say this in the, in the, in the, when, when, when dealing with the question of self-employment. I think any worker in this country who's self-employed at less than twice or three times the, the minimum wage or in any part of the world would give their left arm to be a sanitary worker or a janitor to work in the most inhuman conditions so long as they got regular jobs with pensions, with health care, with, 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 yeah, with, 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 with time off. And it's something to think how, how people queue up to, to, for, the, for these jobs if there is an opportunity for a regular job. So uh, we, we do need to think very hard about uh, the, the alternative that our multilaterals have posed uh, and in fact, this country's policy establishment tom toms about you know schemes and programs for self-employment. Do they really create? Do they create economic security? Do they create a secure social uh, social environment? Um, I mean, you know, to to to, to uh, 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 In fact, I find a reference to her in your your your, your report. Um, you know, Barbara Harris White talks about the difference, the distinction between those who are those who are self-employed and engage in capital accumulation. <laughs> Or those who are engaged in self-exploitation. I think that's and in this and in this country and in most parts of the global south, uh, self-employment for the largest, for the overwhelming majority, you know, say for Mr. Ambani and a small bunch of others, is about is is really about about self-exploitation. Um, in a sense, what the what the you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to sort of fall prey to Mr. Desai's references to, 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 to multiplicity of unions. I don't think that's, that's, that's what we're here to talk about. We'll talk about that over tea. But I will certainly come back to, to, to you know, the question of regular wage contracts, which do come with a certain degree of trade union pressure and trade union power. And for as long as I have been in the trade union movement, I've, I've, I've heard critiques of the decline of the trade union. There is no doubt we have in different parts of the world, including in this country, through the 90s especially, faced a declining membership. We may have turned the corner now, but we still have, 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 have a long way to go. That cannot just, that's not just the trade unions problematic. That is part of the policy regime of the, of that, that came in, you know, into the late 1970s and the early 80s, that's been pushed on the ground in country after country. It's, there's a humbug. In, you know, there's an ideological humbug in this country that what you need is labor law reform, and that what will be freeing up labor markets will, will actually create full employment or more employment. Uh, not just do we need tighter regulation of employment of, of employment laws, but we also need better rights to freedom of association. And I think that's 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 very important in terms of political rights. That's an element of political rights. And most countries, India, at the top of that heap haven't even, even uh, uh, ratified ILO conventions on the right to freedom of association and uh, the right to collective bargaining. If I'm to sort of, you know, really pull, wind up, 
I, 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 I wind up with, you know, sort of pulling, pulling the, the uh, macro in a sense that Mr. Desai tried to, if you were to put in place the wage basket and the social protection and social security basket to fight inequality through a, you know, in a way reconstruct the social wage, uh, yes, we do find we have to address the tax system. And I think that's elemental. And inherent, inheritance tax, I think, is critical. But I would add to that in the Indian context, property tax too. We're a country with, 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 with people who own property, literally, that could be sterling or dollar denominated and, and, and pay piffling, pay changes as, 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 as property duties. Uh, uh, you know, this is about, about asset inequality. I was actually pleased to hear, read a, ref, uh, you know, a little piece you pulled out in your report of Michael Lipton on land reform. Uh, this may not be a political climate anywhere in the world where you can actually talk about redistribution of assets, but I think we certainly can, should be talking about taxing assets and taxing, taxing property. Uh, yeah, which would, after a fashion, help us put together the basket, so to speak, of what's the social wage, and then we look at uh, uh, um, uh, how, to, how to ensure that we, we can win the social wage. Uh, one final word on what's already been said in, in, at some length is, I think, part of the inequality debate in the social context would also mean addressing the dignity of work. Uh, I think everybody knows what I mean, and I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Dr. At first, I would like to congratulate all the members who have contributed in this report, uh, Professor Johnson and uh, Dr. Rajesh and Dr. Matthew, and the scholars who have contributed in these chapters, in their chapters. And uh, as we have seen during the presentation, the report has covered wide dimension of inequality across all over the world including social justice, health insurance, coverage, all these things. As a trend demographer, I would like to add something in this debate. Uh, considering the ongoing demographic and epidemiological transition, if we see the India or low and middle income countries, this country uh, which show a significant reduction in fertility and mortality and, uh, and increasing life expectancy along with the <coughs> growing burden of disease with increasing burden of non-communicable disease. And um, uh, so the, the emerging concern is the addressing health needs of the elderly population. As we know that the india East population is currently the second largest in the world after China with 103 million population, elderly population. And as per UN criteria, the country, uh, as per United Nations stat statistical projection indicate that the India elderly population that is 60 and above is expected to be increased by 13% in 2025 and further to 21% in 2015. So if the percentage of elderly population is above 7% in any country, as per, as per UN criteria, that, that country is aging. So in other words, India has emerged as aging in India in the beginning of 21st century. So it can also be observed that the percentage of elderly had all along been higher in rural areas compared to urban areas and usually more among females than among males. Further, with the increasing rate of migration of younger generation from rural to urban areas in search of jobs, education and better living condition, older population faces huge challenges due to fact that Elderly care has been long been considered as household responsibility in traditional societies like India. So as for the inequality in health outcomes is concerned, few research has shown that the prevalence of chronic illness, disability, and health uh, assessing the uh, health care services are significantly varies by the sex of the respondent and education, economic status, and place of residence. Uh, in my own published research, where we have decomposed the overall health inequality among the older population in India based on the national sample survey data. And we have found that poor economic status is the dominant contributor of the overall health inequality, that is 54%, followed by the economic, uh, illiteracy of the respondent, and uh, that is 24%, and rural place of residence, that is 20%. 
So, to addressing the persisting health inequality among older population, comprehensive efforts are needed. Like in case of India, there is a need to improve the income security for older individuals, which is rupees 200 per month for the age group 60 to 79 year age group, and rupees 500 for the age group 80 and above, which is quite low. So further, there is a need to promote the policies and program for the prevention, detection, and treatment of the non-communicable disease, especially among the vulnerable group, uh, such as women, poor, <coughs> illiterate, rural, and elderly who are living alone. So this is important both for the India population of older adults and for the current generation of the younger adults to ensure future healthy aging. So my presentation, my thoughts is basically related to health, not the economic inequality. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Can I just add, I'm really happy, very happy that Dr. Singh has brought this issue up. The single biggest cause of people slipping into poverty in India is catastrophic health illness. Mm. It is the single biggest cause. You, there's a survey which I saw for Kerala, where they looked at families which had a family member who needed heart treatment. 84% of those families slipped into poverty. They were not in poverty, but they slipped into poverty. And then they, when you read about the coping strategies, to, you, you, it, it's, it's really you wonder what's about, what, 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 what kind of, uh, you know, taking children out of school, for instance, and, and things like that. Go any day to any of our public hospitals, and you see how families from villages have to camp there for, for health treatment. And it's not just the cost of the treatment. It's the fact that a whole family is unable to work, yeah. and it's a loss of livelihood. In fact, I saw a survey of travel in India, and in rural areas, the single biggest reason for traveling out of the village is for health care. I tell you, this is, it, it, it is, is one of the things which can be tackled, has to be tackled, because it really is. Uh, I'm really, really, very happy that you raised this issue, uh, because I think this is, to me, a uh, doable thing, it can be done, and I don't see any reason why we cannot do something fairly, uh, at least about catastrophic health. At least tackle that. And uh, I've seen many surveys on this. And, uh, and, it's, this, and so I, that's the only thing I wanted to add to what uh, Dr. Singh was saying, which I, you're very right to focus on this. You should not apologize for focusing on that. Uh, you, are, you, are, uh, you are absolutely right to focus on this because I think. Frankly, this is one of the most important immediately tackled reasons uh, which we can have. And, and uh, even Gautam referred to it in terms of the absence of you know, health. Sickly. Yeah. Sickly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.